Hello, I'm Michael, and today we'll be talking to Louise Alcock. She is a below the bar lecturer in NUIG with a keen interest in the ecology and evolution of mollusks and cephalopods in particular. She also works with sea sponges and idalians. Not only that now, but last year she was the staff partner for the Explorer Project, the Undergraduate Science Fair. What got you so interested in working with cephalopods, sponges and idalians? What can we learn from them? I became fascinated by uh, cephalopods, that's octopuses and squids, early on in life, probably when I was a teenager or even younger, uh, watching Jacques Cousteau natural history programmes on the BBC when I was a kid. Um, and Jacques Cousteau was a pioneer of, of aqualungs and, and, and deep sea underwater research. Um, and he had these wonderful videos. Um, which were pioneering about marine life and, and I just fell in love with octopuses at that point and I went off to university to um, study marine biology and um, I worked nice and hard and got a first class degree and then I had the opportunity to uh, stay on and do a PhD and I pretty much at that point I wrote for my own funding so I had a choice of whatever I wanted to work on and I chose to work on the octopuses um, in fact I chose to work on Antarctic octopuses because most like most young people I thought the, uh, the chance to go down to the Antarctic and study down there would be pretty awesome. So I chased funding to do that and I got it. And so then I spent uh, four years doing a PhD on Antarctic octopuses, which was awesome. And I had about uh, six or seven trips to the uh, Antarctic on various research vessels belonging to different countries. Um, and I had a wonderful time. And I had had these plans that I would study the population genetics of octopuses. So I wanted to know what the effects of the ice ages had been on the octopuses, because obviously the, the glaciation situation in Antarctica changed massively in the in the ice ages and between the ice ages. And of course, there have been lots of um, major glaciation cycles in in the Southern Ocean. So. It's a really great place to study this. But actually what happened was when I got to the Southern Ocean for the first time, I realized that where there were supposed to be three species of octopuses, there were probably closer to 20. So actually I spent my whole PhD um, studying octopus taxonomy. That's the naming and description of species to try and sort out the mess before I could start doing what I really wanted to do. And describing all these species, uh, I spent a lot of time in museums around the world because when you want to know whether something's a new species, what you have to do is go and look at what's been described first. And when you describe a species, you have to put one individual in a museum somewhere, and that is the type of that species. And anybody else who wants to decide whether what they've caught is that species has to go and look at that specimen. So I spent a lot of time of my PhD as well um, in museums around the world. And when I was doing that, I discovered that the octopuses in the Antarctic had remarkable similarity to octopuses in the deep sea um, in other places in the world, so the deep sea of the North Atlantic and the deep sea of the North Pacific. And I, I got really fascinated by this. They weren't the same species, but they were definitely related. So I got very interested in the evolution of octopuses and I wanted to figure out where the Antarctic octopuses came from. Um, and I used uh, molecular techniques to do this, so I was sequencing uh, DNA. and Having done all this, what, what uh, we discovered, I, by this time I actually, this took a long time, much longer than my PhD, and by this time I was a lecturer at Queen's in Belfast and I had a postdoc working with me uh, who did a lot of the donkey work. And uh, we discovered that, that the deep sea octopuses had actually evolved from the Antarctic octopuses. And as Antarctica had, had cooled about 15 million years ago and the thermohaline circulation, which spreads deep cold water across the ocean floors outwards from Antarctica, as that had developed, this had given a, a route of a similar habitat for Antarctic octopuses. And they had sort of co basically colonized the deep sea elsewhere and speciated. And so I, because of this, I got really interested in the deep sea. This is a long story. Um, so. At that point, I, I had moved to Galway for, for actually for personal reasons because my husband took a job down here. And um, there was just a, a bit of deep sea work just starting here, and people had found interesting coral. anymore because I'd kind of done that because I'd, I'd already redescribed uh, 
all the species of octopuses in the North Atlantic. Um, but I got interested in other groups that are difficult in terms of taxonomy. Octopuses are really difficult because they're squidgy. And anything that's squidgy is difficult in terms of taxonomy because what you need is hard characters mm. that don't vary uh, between individuals to tell whether individuals are the same species or not. Um, so I already had a fascination with groups that were taxonomically difficult. And that's how I got interested in uh, sponges and particularly cnidarians. I've always had a kind of thing for sea anemones since I was an undergrad because they're, they're cool and they could eat a baby if they wanted to. You know, they're, they're, they are that level of predator. Um, so, so I had this ongoing fascination with cnidarians anyway. Um, and at the same time I was going out to the deep sea, there was a biodiscovery program starting in uh, Ireland, of which NUI Galway was playing a large part. And biodiscovery bio is the search for novel pharmaceutical products um, from, from natural organisms. And the groups, two groups that have been shown to be really good at, for this are cnidarians and sponges. So we also had a team of biochemists and chemists here who were really interested in, in getting products from the, from the sponges and the cnidarians but they didn't necessarily know that much about the animals because they're chemists and biochemists, not zoology. So there was a very good reason as well to get involved in looking at these, these animals so as to really help as part of a team um, with this biodiscovery work, even though I don't know the first thing about chemistry. Um, but I do know a little bit about cnidarians and, and since working in the deep sea here, I'm starting to know more and more about cnidarians. And of course we have really fascinating groups in our deep sea here because we have some really rare groups like uh, black corals um, which are CITES listed. This is for trade in endangered animals and actually black corals are so rare that, that they have a CITES listing and for example if I would want to share them with a, with a colleague in, in Europe I would actually need to get an export license for my samples. They're, they're that well protected. Last year you were involved in the undergraduate science fair by the Explorer Initiative. Could you describe this and what it was like for you? Okay, so this was, this was kind of completely lateral to most of what I do. Um, and I was approached by an undergraduate student, who uh, Joanne Duffy, who wanted to put on an undergrad science fair. And she didn't really come to me because I had any experience in doing this. Joanne came to me because at the start of her second year there is a limited number of lecturers that she knew I think and I of course teach first year biology um, which is a huge course with with a large number of students and I run the entire zoology part of that so every first year student who takes science knows me basically um, I, by the by the time they finish their degree they know other lecturers far better but at the end of the first year everybody knows me um, and so I would think I was an obvious friendly place to, to knock on the door of and, and that's how I got involved and in fact the first thing I said to Joanne when she came into my office is that you know I, I'm rubbish at this sort of thing this is just so not me um, but I know someone who's really good at this who uh, was our colleague Sarah Knight who was the outreach officer for the Ryan Institute and Sarah is involved in, in outreach projects all the time so public understanding of science so she is the ideal person to help us put on a science fair um, and of course organising anything in the university you have to know how the university works so you have to know where you get chairs from where you book a room who you ask for this and, and actually this was one of the reasons I said to Joanne I'm going to be no help at this because I'm an academic, I, I know an awful lot about octopuses, quite a lot about the deep sea, but I know very little about where to get a chair from in the university. So um, we got Sarah involved anyway, who knows all these things, as well as being great at um, explaining science to younger people. Um, um, but to be fair, Joanne did most of the work uh, and she really uh, pulled it off. So she organised a, a, a great group of people to run the fair. She got the hardcore of outreach in the university, which of course includes eco explorers, also included cell explorers, a few other groups, and she got some friends involved, and then she invited uh, anyone who basically had an interest in presenting something. So students throughout the university, anyone who had a, an idea to present, she invited them to come and do it. And and we as the staff gave those students uh, a little bit of support in, in getting a, a, a little stall together and then Joanna invited lots of primary schools from around Galway to come up and we really had a sort of humming event for a day over in uh, the view in, in Arsenal Clan. Hmm. Well, that 
Well, thank you for your time. This has been very interesting, and we hope to hear more from you in the future. Thank you. <laughs>